Now that the Falcons have Kirk Cousins, does it mean that they are legit Super Bowl contenders or will all our hopes and dreams ultimately fall short? You are Locked On Falcons, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back, everyone, to another illustrious episode of the Locked On Falcons podcast, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast, part of Locked On Sports Atlanta, your team every day. And today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On for twenty dollars off your first purchase. So, guys, if you don't know me, I'm your very humble host, Aaron Freeman. Been covering the Falcons for far too long, formerly at Falcons.com. RIP. You may also know me as Sirius Black, a.k.a. Mr. Drew, a.k.a. the Jolly Green Giant, a.k.a. Mr. A.k.a. And of course, I appreciate each and every one of you that is along for this, you know, journey around the sun each and every day as everydayers. Uh, and all you got to do to become an everydayer and go on this journey with us is subscribe or follow for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. So today is purely a mailbag episode. We've reached that point in the off season where there's not a whole lot else sort of specifically that I want to talk about. And so now I put it on you guys to, you know, give me things to talk about. And uh, this one is exclusively for the Locked On Falcons insiders who get priority. They are paying customers after all. But if you sign up to become a Locked On Falcons insider, you won't have to pay for two whole weeks. You get a 14 day free trial before, you know, you get great value, $4.99 a month. Not only do you get priority on these mailbags that we do so often uh, throughout the year, but also you get access to some of my film reviews, not only in-season stuff, but out-of-season stuff. Just recently did a breakdown of all five of the Falcons' new free agent additions and what they're bringing to the table. And we'll continue to talking about the top quarterbacks and the top draft prospects at a number of positions. So all that in store for you. All you got to do is hit the link in the description below at joinsubtext.com slash Lockdown Falcons to become a Lockdown Falcons insider. So a lot of great questions. You know, we're going to talk offensive line. You know, Joe Alt, possibly as a Falcons first round pick, if he's going to be the solution to our Max Crosby and Micah Parsons size problems this year, you know, should we get our hopes up for Spencer Rattler being that QB of the future or should we wait for Shadur Sanders? And I'm also going to take over from uh, Ryan Pace, I mean, Terry Fontenot for a month as the general manager. And will that lead to signings like Justin Simmons? We'll get into all of that on today's episode, but we'll start where a lot of you guys are wondering about what your expectations should be for this upcoming season. And our first question comes from anonymous, right? Now that we have a reliable quarterback, do you think the Falcon fans should prepare for a deep playoff run in 2024 or 2025 would be the year to shoot for? Now, personally, I'm more focused on 2025 than I am 2024. You know, I'll believe it when I see it, when it comes to 2024. And a lot of that is based off of, I think you're going to get a better version of Kirk Cousins in 2025 than you are in 2024 coming off the Achilles being more comfortable in the scheme. You know, historically, some of Kirk's best years have been year two where he's been in the same offense. You look at, you know, the improvement he made from 2015 to 2016, year two under Sean McVay. Technically, 2019 uh, was the second season he had with Tevin, Kevin Stefanski as his play caller where Stefanski took over as interim play caller in the back half of the 2018 season. And then you saw, you know, the beginning of this 2023 season where it was year two of Kevin Stef uh, Kevin O'Connell uh, in Minnesota. So I also think, you know, besides the quarterback, a lot of your other top players are going to be in the second year under Zach Robinson, assuming Zach Robinson lasts more than uh, a season here in Atlanta, which, you know, I won't say it's a safe assumption, but is probably going to happen. Um, you know, barring the Falcons being a Super Bowl team, but later on that, uh, making that deep postseason run this upcoming season. But, you know, I think all those guys will be better. Uh, not to mention, you know, I'm hoping that next offseason will be a little less complacent in terms of upgrading some of the areas of the roster uh, rather than sort of what they've done this offseason, which is kind of assume that they're a quarterback away. Uh, our next question comes from Eddie R. He says, hey, Aaron, I guess the best way to put my question succinctly is, am I underestimating Kirk Cousins? I'm not one of these people who was against bringing him to Atlanta. However, once that happened, there was one personality on the four letter network exclaiming Atlanta was a Super Bowl contender. Now I've been kind of viewing having Kirk as a mulligan 
on the end of Matt Ryan's career here, a chance to stay competitive while the team searches for the actual QB of the future. I'm not expecting championships or Super Bowl appearances out of him. Yeah, I, I'm in the similar boat, Eddie. I, I'm not expecting the Falcons to win a Super Bowl with Kirk Cousins over the next three years. Now, I do think having Kirk Cousins means that the path to getting there is a lot easier than it probably would be with pretty much any of the all, other alternative options that the realistic alternative option, you know, obviously, you know, Caleb Williams, if you, if you believe uh, in him as a prospect would probably be your best bet at this point in time, this off season to, to buy into the Super Bowl hopes, but that was never a realistic option for the Falcons. So I think Kirk is probably the best of the uh, realistic options, you know, my kind of hopes for the Falcons next two years, and I would love to be underestimating them, but it's kind of like, I think they're, you know, hopefully they're going to turn out to be the next two years of, of Falcons football are going to be kind of like the last two years of Lions football, right? And it's not really about whether you believe the Lions are a true blue Super Bowl contender. It's just getting buy-in and, and believing, hey, the people that are running the show, like it is with Dan Campbell and Brad Holmes in Detroit, as well as you know some of the young pieces they've added across that roster, you get a lot of buy-in and you just believe, hey, we're in good hands by really competent people. And that's what I'm kind of hoping out of Raheem Morris and Zach Robinson and Terry Fontenot and all that stuff. And so if I'm being completely honest with my personal expectations for what the Falcons are going to be over the next couple of years, rather than being the Lions, they're probably going to be something like what the Vikings have been over the last couple of years, which is a competitive team, but probably not a true blue series contender. But again, I would love to be wrong about that. Now, our next question comes from Drew. He asks, some NFL media analysts predicted Falcons as a 10 and seven win division uh, winning team. I am personally rooting for a 12 win or more season and sweeping the division. If the Falcons fall short of those expectations, what side of the ball do you believe will fall short? And what do you believe will be the cause coaching talent or 50 50? Now, I'll say this again. I've said it a million times on this podcast over the last couple of years. Team success is primarily driven by offensive success. So when you look at the 12 plus win teams over the last two years, you know, seven of those, there were seven of those teams in 2022. Guess what? They were seven of the eight top offenses in the league that year. There were four 12 plus win teams last year. They were four out of the top five offenses in the league last year. So if the Falcons are going to be a 12 win team, it's going to be probably because they have a top five offense in the league. And if they don't have a top five offense, that will be the biggest uh, factor against them having a 12 plus win type of season. Now, when you look at those, you know, exceptions to that, the 2023 Dolphins were the fifth offensive top offensive team that didn't win 12 games. Guess what? They won 11 games, right? The 2022 Lions were the eighth top offensive team uh, that year, they won nine games and mostly because they had a bottom three defense that year. And that, you know, if you assume that the Falcons don't have a defense that awful, like if they have a 20th best defense in the league, which I think is a reasonable assumption to have, then it will be the offense that's going to dictate their success uh, and whether or not they reach the goal. So, you know, as far as the thing that could hold them back from reaching their goals, right? You know, it could be anything. It could be quarterback play. It could be the run game struggling. It could be injuries. It could be play calling. It could be not having enough weapons. All of that is on the table. Time will tell on that. You know, that's the sort of unpredictable, unknown nature of how football is. And so we'll just sort of have to see on that. So uh, we will move the conversation forward and and talk, uh, answer some more questions. But, you know, I, I know probably to some of you guys, you're like, oh, a classic Aaron being Mr. Drew and being negative or whatever. I just, part of it is just my general outlook and in, in existence, right? I think part of it is I don't have the same sort of, um, I guess, hopes and dreams that a lot of Falcon fans have. Like when they lost their last Super Bowl, right? At that point in time, I was roughly had been a Falcon fan for 25 years. And basically the, one of the outcomes of that sort of psychological and emotional trauma that came with 28 to three was I made peace with the idea afterwards that if I have to wait another 25 years to see the Falcons win a Super Bowl, I did it once. I can do it again. Now I'm not rooting to wait to 25 years. Uh, I'm not rooting to wait to Super Bowl 75 or whatever the number is for the Falcons to win another Super Bowl, uh, to win a their first Super Bowl. Like I would ideally like that to be, you know, this upcoming season. But if that happens, you know, as I say, you can only control what you can control, and so like that's part of it where I make peace with it. And I think part of, you know, the perception of this team from a lot of folks in, you know, I think having interacted with Falcon fans on a near daily basis for like 25 years on the internet has made me kind of an amateur psychologist because, you know, as condescending as this may sound, like I know most fans takes aren't based off of, I went and watched film 
And so I'm basing it off of evidence. It's really just based off of how you feel in the moment. And so I've become sort of an amateur psychologist over the last 25 years trying to figure out why fans have certain takes and why they have certain opinions because it's not based off of stats and evidence at all in film study. It's just based off of how you feel in the moment. And so for that reason, I think for a lot of fans, they haven't made peace with the idea. They're they're basically desperate for the team to redeem that Super Bowl loss. And that colors their perception of every move that this team makes. That basically, if you're not making a move that's going to put you over the top to be a Super Bowl team, then it's a waste of money. It's a waste of draft picks. It's a waste of whatever. And that's colored people's perception of the Falcons' choices at quarterback uh, these last couple of years. Um, and I, I get it, but at the same time, I don't really agree with it. So I just wanted to point that out just because like, you know, when if you're just judging Kirk Cousins through the lens of does he make us a Super Bowl team, yes or no, the answer is probably no. But if you judge it from a more nuanced opinion, which is does he get you closer to being a Super Bowl team, I think the answer is yes. And so if you have that level of nuance in your perspective, like you can make peace with Kirk Cousins, even if you're not sitting here convinced that, hey, we're going to win a Super Bowl in the next two years. Again, I think there's a chance, but a lot of other things have to go right. And it's not just solely based off of Kirk Cousins. He's a big part of it. As we know, quarterback play is, you know, sort of the biggest factor. But I think the mistake that so many fans and even media make is thinking it's the only factor, right? And I've talked about this before, where it's like, if you watch this past year's Super Bowl between the Chiefs and 49ers and your only conclusion was the reason why the Chiefs won is because they have Patrick Mahomes and the reason why the 49ers lost is because they have Brock Purdy, I don't think you were really watching the game. I think you went into the game with a bias and you just confirmed your bias. But if you really watch the game, like special teams kind of decided the outcome of that game more so than the quarterback play. And it's not to say the quarterbacks had nothing to do with it, but it was such a close game that one or two mistakes on special teams flipped it. And it's not really you know, oh, Patrick Mahomes is the best in the league and Brock Purdy is the 17th best quarterback in the league. And that was the deciding outcome of that game. Again, a blocked field goal and a muff punt, you know, really, to me, were it. But that's just my opinion. I know there are differing opinions out there. But we will continue today's mailbag. Uh, I'm going to take over for Terry as the general manager for a month and we'll talk about some of the moves I might make between now and the draft. Now, guys, I want to tell you about Game Time, the fast and easy way to buy tickets to all the sports, comedy, music, theater, new you. They have so many things that take the guesswork out of buying tickets, like killer last-minute deals. You can buy tickets in seconds right up to the start of the event. All in prices means you don't have to worry about hidden fees. You can see the view from your seat before you buy, so you know exactly what to expect when you arrive. And don't forget their Game Time guarantee, which means you're going to get the best price. If you find tickets in the same section and row for less, they'll credit you 110% the difference. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app. Create an account. Use code Locked On for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code Locked On L O C K E D O N for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. So I know you guys get tired of watching all the screaming all day on your four letter networks, uh, as one of our listeners already referred to it. And so make the switch to Locked On Sports today, the free twenty four seven sports streaming channel program for you every day to bring you the biggest stories without all the screaming locked on sports today brings you can't miss analysis opinions and news streaming 24 7 on youtube or the free amazon fire tv channels app and also check out locked on sports atlanta's 24 7 streaming channel on those same platforms it's all part of locked on podcast network your team every day so another anonymous listener and insider says say you switch bodies and now terry fontenot uh and, and for now and say till the draft how would you construct the roster in that scenario so my options i'm going to go with what i think are semi-realistic you know i could sit here and be like i would sign all the pro bowlers right but i'm going to try to go with like realistic options several of these players have connections to this coaching staff so you know i, I need to free up some cap space in order to make some moves right so i'm going to cut taylor heineke I'm going to cut Mike Hughes. That's going to free up about $10 million in cap space. And then I'm going to do a max restructure on Chris Lynch. And that's going to be give me another $9 million in cap space. And with that money, you know, I'll replace Taylor Heineke as the QB2 with probably Carson Wentz for like $2 million. Uh, I want to sign another veteran on the interior of the offensive line, someone like a Michael Dieter, 
who uh, played in Miami under our assistant offensive line coach, Sean Flaherty, to a cheap veteran minimum deal. I want to get a nose tackle in the building so I don't have to waste a draft pick on that. Get Josh Tupo from the Bengals, another big Samoan 350-pound guy. You know, the player that you guys think Tavondre Sweat is going to be, Josh Tupo is already that player. Um, and, you know, I need to get some pass rush in here. Uh, I'm going to go with Carl Lawson, the signing I wanted the team to make in 2021. So we'll redeem that one. Uh, if not him, then maybe Kyle Vanoi or possibly even both, right? Um, and then I need to get a safety in here, probably John Johnson from the Rams, right? And wide receiver, cornerback are two positions I would love to add the position at, but I think there's a chance that we might be able to solve that in the first round of the draft. And so if we don't get that, then I'll punt that till after the draft. So that would be my plan between now and the draft. So address those other, you know, depth roles, role players, spots, and then wait and see at wide receiver and quarterback. So Sam B asks, free agent cornerback group is still pretty intact. Do you think any of these old vets like Xavier Howard or Tredavious White could be short-term fits for a CB2 vacancy? And if so, who and for what terms? So in those two specifics, like, could they be uh, fits? Sure. Anything is possible. Will they be doubtful? You know, I, I heard that Xavier Howard mentioned on a recent podcast that he would love to play for his hometown team, the Texans, last week. Um, and he probably, from what I've heard, some of the fallout of his release in Miami is like, he wants to play in a man-heavy scheme on defense, and that's not necessarily what I expect the Falcons to deploy. Uh, you know, Travis White's an excellent player when healthy. The problem is he hasn't been very healthy. He's missed 33 games over the last five seasons, 24 in the last two seasons. So betting on him to stay healthy at this point isn't a great bet. So again, as I mentioned, I, I probably would wait until after the draft to see if we didn't get a good answer in April at that position before circling back to a free agent corner. Now, Mark C asks, any chance the Falcons are looking at Justin Simmons? He seems like a great fit all around. Probably not. I think mostly due to age and, and price tag that the Falcons will look for either a cheaper option like a John Johnson or, you know, a younger option in the draft. Um, with so many holes, this comes from Cam C, uh, Mark's brother, uh, with so many holes to fill on our roster, mainly in defense, who from last year that is a free agent do you think would be worth bringing back to add depth? And would that roster make us a playoff team with the teams we play this year? No. Um, no. Usually no individual move uh, is going to make you a playoff team and certainly not a depth piece. I would probably bring back Trey Flowers at this point. Uh, you know, we talked about it all last summer. Trey Flowers is not a good outside corner, uh, so he's not an option there. But, you know, in terms of doing other things with Trey Flowers, like asking him to play special teams, um, playing some dime defense, covering tight ends, all that stuff. Like he's very competent in those roles. Uh, and if you bring him back with the idea that that's what he's going to do rather than what we saw in the first three games of last year and be an outside corner, then, you know, I, I think Trey Flowers is a worthwhile depth re-signing at this point in time. So um, we got more to come, uh, including whether or not we should be worried about Caleb McGarry going up against some of these pass rushes that the Falcons are going to face this year, and whether or not Notre Dame tackle Joe Alt at the top of this year's draft is a potential solution to those problems. And we'll also continue discussing the future at quarterback. We've already discussed sort of what Kirk Cousins is bringing to the table in the short term. But is there a quarterback worthwhile to develop behind him in this year's draft, like a Spencer Rattler? Or should the Falcons wait until 2025 and, and bet on a Shador Sanders? And we'll get into all of that, guys, to wrap up today's Locked on Falcons. Now say goodbye to busted brackets because FanDuel is going to let you bet on every game of this year's tournament. Whether you're betting on the big upset or the one seed, it's time to go dancing on America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet wins. That's 200 bucks to use on point spreads, money lines. I love that parlay hub where FanDuel is going to help you find great parlays. And you can even pick in this year's tournament who's going to win it all. And if you're not interested in March Madness, of course, you got NFL draft props that are going strong on FanDuel. Jared Verse, plus 700 to be the eighth overall selection, right? Seven to one odds, right? Quinion Mitchell, nine to one odds to be the eighth overall selection. You're going to find great odds tonight. Join the fun and get those odds right now before they change uh, against you as, you know, the next month rolls ahead so all you got to do visit fanduel.com slash locked on you can bet on nfl draft props you can bet on the upcoming season you can bet on nhl or you can bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets 
So tomorrow's episode, we should be joined by Dave Choate, the Falcoholic himself. And I know a lot of you guys submitted questions, uh, Locked on Falcons Insiders. So some of these questions we'll probably get to tomorrow and we'll get, you know, the Falcoholic himself to answer some of these questions, uh, such as like, you know, what players are going to make the biggest jump from year one to year two, what players from year two to year three. I know that was a question. Definitely want to get into that, but that's probably on tomorrow's. But our next question on today's episode is from, you know, SC initials. Uh, will our O-line hold up to the pass rush? Will we see multiple O-linemen taken in the draft? Is center a priority for this new pass-centric defense? So, yeah, I, I think the Falcons offensive line will hold up. Will we see multiple offensive linemen drafted? Doubtful. You know, I don't even know if we're guaranteed to even see one offensive lineman drafted. Uh, it's probable. Like I would say there's like a 54% chance that they draft an offensive lineman, but I don't know if I go higher than that. I don't think we're going to see them, you know, at a center, right? Drew Dolman, Ryan Newsel, Javon Gwynn are all currently, you know, the three deep roster at center. I don't see there's any reason to add a fourth guy uh, into the mix at this point in time. You just kind of, you know, wait and see. Someone asked me the other day about like, you know, are they going to ride it out with Drew Dolman? And I'm like, yeah, you know, it makes sense to give Drew Dolman this year, see what he does. It's a contract year for him. And if he, if it works out, and he plays well and you want to give him a second contract, you can do that next offseason. If it doesn't, then guess what? You're back in the market for a center. You know, you could just kind of punt that decision until next year. But, you know, when it comes to the offensive line holding up, there are going to be some tough matchups, right? Four of the top 11 teams in terms of sack rate last year are on the Falcons schedule this year. Kansas City, Dallas, Pittsburgh, Las Vegas. Uh, and, of course, those four teams feature some dominant pass rushers on their front, like Chris Jones, Micah Parsons, C.J. Watt, Max Crosby. And, you know, the reality is we're not going to be able to block those guys, so we're just going to have to game plan around that. Um, you know, there's going to be tough days ahead for Caleb McGarry because those guys typically line up on the right side of the offensive line, left side of the defense. Um, and so in those games, you're going to probably chip a lot. So you're probably going to dial up a little bit more 12 personnel those weeks so that you can get Charlie Warner in there uh, to, to give you some six and six and a half seven-man protections to deal with those types of guys. You might also need Pitts to chip a lot more before he releases into the routes. And so if you need Kyle Pitts, you know, those are games that you're probably not going to allow Kyle Pitts to play his best because of that. And so you're going to need your wide receivers and running backs to step up and, and be able to make up the difference in those games. So we'll see if the Falcons could do that. But I know a lot of people, you know, I've seen a lot of rhetoric over the last couple of weeks about, you know, what if Joe Alt, the Notre Dame offensive tackle, the presumptive consensus OT1 in this draft class is there at eight. Uh, if say the Chargers and Titans pass on him, um, it doesn't seem like the Titans are going to do that at seven, but in a world where he's at eight, would, would the Falcons take him? I don't think they would. Um, you know, it's not because I don't think Joe All is a good player. He, he could, you know, for all I know, he could go on and be a Hall of Fame player and we'll look back 10 to 15 years and say he was the best player from this entire draft class. Who knows? But, you know, I don't know if he's. I wouldn't sit here and think that he's going to give you better option at right tackle at least this year in the next couple of years than what you're getting out of Kayla McGarry. I, you know, I know Kayla McGarry is this punching bag for the fan base. I, I know a lot of people think I'm biased because I'm on Kayla McGarry Island. You know, I tried to get off the island last year. He got off to a rough start this past season, like three kind of bad games in September. And then after that point, outside of like one or two games against the Bucks and Titans, he was fine, you know? And so I, I think this idea that Kayla McGarry is like, holding back this offense to a huge degree isn't true. Now, in a world where the Falcons draft a left-handed quarterback like Michael Penix Jr. out of Washington, then I would think that's the, that's the world where I would be like, yeah, Caleb McGarry's not good enough to protect that guy's blind side. But in terms of, you know, Kirk Cousins and whoever else the Falcons have, uh, you know, he's fine. Um, I th My issue with Joe Alt is he's a left tackle. He'd be playing right tackle in this hypothetical scenario where the Falcons pull the trigger on him. And I don't think year one of Joe Alt playing a brand new position, given the history that we know, that it's rare for NFL offensive linemen to hit the ground running, you know, especially tackles when they make the jump to, from college to the NFL. And the rare instances of guys that do like Rashawn Slater and Tristan Wirfs, you know, they're almost never changing positions. Like if you have to change positions, and we saw this with Matt Bergeron last year, right? Like, Asking Joe Alt, you know, let's say in his third NFL game, <laughs> playing a brand new, the third time he's played, the third game where he's played right tackle to block Max Crosby is not a recipe for success. Now, granted, again, I'm not trying to sit here and tell you that Caleb McGarry can do it, but I don't see why Joe Alt would be an upgrade in that. Now, 
you know, Joe Alt could potentially pay off three plus years down the road as he gets more comfortable playing that right tackle position and then eventually switches over to left side to take over for Jake Matthews or something like that. And so, you know, 10, 15 years from now, you'll be like, oh, Joe Alt was on the Mount Rushmore Falcons tackles with Jake and Bob Whitfield and, and Mike Kinn and all that stuff. But like, I don't think it's going to really benefit the team in the short term. And, you know, I would like, you know, ideally, I would like whoever the Falcons get in the first round to be a guy that's going to really help this team this year and next year, right? In this window, this two-year window that we were talking about earlier. But let's move on to C. Ham's question. When you describe described Spencer Rattler on your latest, let your last episode, it sounds to me as if you're describing Desmond Ritter. Even if it's three years away, why should we be excited about it? Well, I don't know. Like, you know, you get excited about what you want to get excited about. But, you know, that's just kind of par for the course for any non-first round quarterbacks. Like, you shouldn't get excited about non-first round quarterbacks, right? But I, I do think Spencer Rattler is a better bet as a third round pick, you know, if in a world where he is a third round pick, then you typically find in a third round, just like I thought Desmond Ritter was a better bet than your typical third round quarterback, right? And, you know, despite a lot of the rhetoric, like the, the data supports that Desmond Ritter has in his first, you know, 17 starts that he's made in the NFL has, is basically like much better than your, or I wouldn't say much better. He's basically average across the board. When you look at, um, you know, the first 17 starts of, of most quarterbacks over the last, you know, 10, 15 years, uh, since the new CBA was signed, um, in terms of outcomes. Um, and so like, you know, I, I still hold that belief that like, you know, he's going to outperform the Davis webs of the world. Right. Um, so like, you know, it is what it is. I, I think Rattler and, and Red Ritter are different, but like, you know, see him if, if, you, <laughs> if they sound the same to you, then all right, cool, whatever. <laughs> like, no, no sweat off my back. Like I'm not going to lose any sleep over. Well, uh, see him thinks, you know, they're the same, like, yeah, in, in larger scheme of things, they, they are the same, just like all non Caleb Williams, the quarterbacks are, they're all, they're all bad bets, right? Like that's just the nature of the beast playing the quarterback position. Now, uh, next question comes from Ernie. A. I just wanted to know your opinion on the quarterback in the draft. I know we are not getting one of the top four quarterbacks. I want to know which quarterback we can get later. That might have good upside. One that could sit a couple of years and be our next QB. I used to be big on Penix, but now I'm thinking Rattler. What do you think? Um, I don't really have a horse in a race, you know, I was invested in, in Desmond Ritter's success because I knew Marcus Mariota was a bridge quarterback, right? My expectation is Kirk Cunn is going to be the Falcons quarterback for the next three years. So there's real little reason for me to get too much of my hopes up that whoever we draft this year is going to be the future of our, our position. Maybe. We'll see, right? Not to mention, I'm not convinced that the Falcons are 100% guaranteed to take a quarterback, right? I think they want to, but it depends on how the board falls, right? So if we get, you know, as you said, we're not getting in the top four. So that next tier, Penix, Bo Nix of Oregon and Spencer Rattler of South Carolina, um, you know, if two of those guys go off the board before pick 43 and the third guy that's left, the Falcons aren't really in love with, you know, we could easily see them punt at the position. So we'll just sort of have to see, you know, um, if I'm sitting here, you know, I, I would probably put more money on Penix or Rattler um, and probably Rattler's probably a little bit more of a better fit in what I envisioned the Zach Robinson offense to be than Penix is. But, you know, I, I think there's a path for Penix to be successful in this offense. He just, you have to, you know, you're going to have to develop it, but we'll see. Um, and our last question also comes from Ernie A. Um, you think we have a chance at Shador Sanders next year? I know he'll be a top player, but we can trade picks for him. You know, I don't know. Um, you know, depending on who you talk to, Shador Dan Sanders is either – the ultimate QB one next year um, or in, in a lock to be a top five pick, or, you know, he's probably a QB three or QB four in in a borderline first round talent. Um, you know, I haven't really watched the door since September, you know, basically Colorado got off to that fast start and I was watching them every Saturday and then they lost. And I was like, I don't care anymore. And then at a certain point I didn't revisit it because like I, I figured Shador was going to stay in school for another year. And so there was no reason for me to do any homework on Shador Sanders as a quarterback prospect for the last like six months. So at some point, you know, we probably get in a couple of months, like June, July, once I'm done with the 2024 Falcons draft class, I'll start looking ahead to the 2025 uh, prospects and including the quarterbacks. Um, you know, we'll see, uh, you know, based off of my six month old opinion, I'm kind of borderline like Shador's probably would be in that tier. Um, he'd probably be in a tier below 
the Jaden Daniels, JJ McCarthy tier and the tier above the Michael Penix Jr. Spencer Rattler tier for me. So maybe we'll, uh, we'll see. We'll see what happens over the next, you know, year, year and a half. So time will tell on that. But tomorrow's episode, we will be joined by Dave Choate of the Falcoholic uh, to answer some more listener questions as well as get Dave's thoughts on free agency fo- so far and, and what's still left on the table for the Falcons to address um, in the draft. It's, uh, that's your first listen tomorrow. Check out Lockdown Sports Atlanta, Lockdown Sports Today. It's all part of Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day.